Hello everyone and welcome to the final day of National Space Academy's Takeover Week. We have been taking over the National Space Centre's social media channels all week to talk to some really cool people within the space sector. I am here today with uh, David Pollard from Spaceport Cornwall. Hi Dave, how are you doing? Hi, hi Nat. Yeah, very well. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, no, thank you for being here. Uh, really exciting stuff that's going on. Um, so I was just wondering if you could start off by just introducing yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Dave Pollard. I'm the Education and Outreach Manager at Spaceport Cornwall. Um, I've got a short presentation uh, just to play to you now, and then we're going to be taking questions afterwards, so uh, please get asking. Slight technical glitch. We're just going to see if we can get this working for you, Dave. Thanks, Nat. Hello, my name is Dave Pollard and I am the Spaceport Cornwall Education and Outreach Manager. Thanks for having me here today to talk to you about who we are, what we do um, and what opportunities there may be for you in the future. Um, our motto at Spaceport Cornwall is launch our future. But today I want this to be about launching your future and that you might think about the space sector as something you want to get into in the future. Um, I want to start off with a video. Um, this is a video from Virgin Orbit that happened a few weeks ago, and, and I'll move on to why I'm showing you this in a second. So here's a video from Virgin Orbit. LC, this is LDN Control. We are currently on track uh, for our nominal timeline, and our current uh, drop time as listed in Trillion is 1925 UTC. Planet control and flight crew has been boarded the aircraft. Cosmic Girl, this is our orbit base. You are go for takeoff. Copy, go for takeoff. Altitude 3000. And over base, Cosmic Girl is starting to turn to the inbound. Pulling now. Pull. Pulling. Release. Release, release, release. This is ignited. Confirm Newton 3 engine startup. Max Alpha cheating. QVC is in first stage looking good. We had a pretty awesome view up here. Max Q Alpha achieved. Big one burn nominal. Stage set break wires broken. Newton force startup complete. It was recovered and we are now returning to base. Bearing break wires broken. Launcher one's in space. Sounds like the blue sky is one This is ready to head on control. Mauritius has confirmed acquisitions. Payload separation confirmed. So that video is really important to us because uh, Virgin Orbit's technology that they've used there, um, that is exactly what they're going to be bringing um, to Spaceport Cornwall to have a first launch here in 2022. And um, Spaceport Cornwall is going to be based at Cornwall Airport Newquay. Um, and the reason for this is because it's got one of the longest runways in the UK. It's a largely uncongested airspace, so it means there's not too much air traffic. But also, most importantly, it's got almost direct access over the sea, um, which is a great place for launching planes and launching rockets. It's a lot safer. Um, I've now got a video to show you, um, which will tell you a little bit more about Spaceport Cornwall um, and how things may look in, in the future.
hopefully you've got a clearer picture of who we are and what we're going to do. And, and this is what we're going to be able to see from Spaceport Cornwall in 2022. And we're all really excited about that. Um, you may have seen uh, in the news uh, over the last sort of few years, really, there's been a huge increase in the amount of discussion around um, launching satellites into space. Um, and the reason for this is because satellites have come down in size greatly. Um, they used to be the size of sort of a mini, up to the size of sort of a minibus. Now you can get ones that are the size of a lunchbox or, or even smaller. And because they've come down in size, they've also come down in price. So you can now launch a satellite for less than one million pounds, which still sounds like a lot of money, but it, but it's not compared to the sort of tens of millions of pounds that, that it would have cost to launch satellites in the past. So you can now also get um, satellites like these, which are called CubeSats, um, and these are sort of 10 inch by 10 inch satellites. Um, and, they, and these are an example of a small satellite. And the expectation is that we're going to need another 32,000 small satellites in orbit by 2030. So here's a little bit of the science about um, the different types of orbit. So we've got four different types of orbit going around our Earth. Um, we've got HEO, which stands for High Earth Orbit. We've got MEO, which stands for Mid Earth Orbit. We've got GEO, which stands for Geosynchronous Earth Orbit. And th this is an incredibly important orbit. It's just over uh, 22,000 miles away. Um, but things that are satellites that are put up in this orbit will rotate around the Earth at exactly the same speed as the Earth rotates. So if you have a satellite dish, uh, say a Goonhilly Earth Station, pointing at that satellite, as that satellite dish rotates uh, with the Earth's rotation, it will continuously point at that geostationary Earth orbit. Um, so, so that's a really important orbit um, and a very busy orbit as well. We, um, the satellites that we'll be launching from Spaceport Cornwall are in LEO, which stands for Low Earth Orbit. And LEO um, is less than 2,000 kilometres, but, but can be as low as 160 kilometres up um, in, in, um, in, in orbit. Um, and the International Space Station is a great example of, of a low Earth orbit satellite, and that's, that's about 220 miles um, up. And satellites in this orbit tend to be launched in constellations um, so that they can kind of interlink um, and stay over. Uh, they can always pass data back um, to a, a receiver dish um, wherever they are around, um, around the world. Um, and low Earth orbit satellites can be used for things like um, communication, especially in defence, where um, communication speeds are really important and, and they don't need to, to bounce quite as high off of a satellite, but also um, for low Earth observation. And low Earth observation can be used for looking at a lot of environmental things. So this is an example of looking uh, at a drought in South America uh, and they take pictures uh, at the same time each year to look how um, bad the drought is each, each year. Um, you can, farmers can also use low Earth observation. Um, so um, there are farms now that use low Earth observation to identify areas of a field that might need um, extra fertilizer or extra pesticides. So rather than fertilizing or using pesticides on the whole field, a farmer is able to identify specific areas. Um, and then in the future, who knows, that could be linked to um, an autonomous uh, farm vehicle that could then go and, and lay that fertilizer. Um, again, using GPS satellite data um, to, for that vehicle to move. Um, Low Earth observation again uh, can also be used for tracking illegal fishing. Um, so, uh, in the past, it's been historically very difficult to, to work out where every, where everybody is fishing, uh, but now using data, um, we're able to see where people are fishing and if people are fishing illegally. Also um, good for monitoring pollution levels. So um, this is a satellite uh, called Sentinel-5P, and this was launched uh, purely for environmental reasons. Um, and you can see on the screen here that it's picking up nitrogen dioxide levels over the course of a week in the UK. Um, and you've got the date um, in, the, in the top uh, right hand corner and the day. Um, and you can see that throughout the week, uh, the nitrogen dioxide levels uh, are quite high, especially in the city areas of sort of London, Liverpool, Manchester. Um, but then towards the end of the week, that tails off. So that might suggest that um, commuting times um, it, it is having a detrimental effect um, on nitrogen dioxide levels. And um, with COVID, it's going to be very interesting to see how that has changed. 
And the reason that we track all of these things is, is so that we can see what we need to change, but also if we have made changes, what impact has that had? Um, and satellites are used to pick up all of that data um, and share that back. Satellites can also surprise us sometimes. Um, so this is uh, a satellite that was launched to look at the ice shells um, and they, they actually identified a new colony of emperor penguins um, by finding one of his old um, nesting areas. Um, so that, that was just quite a nice thing to add in. So what is the opportunity? Um, so for us in, in Cornwall, we're looking at developing a, a space cluster. We're going to have a runway and a spaceport with Spaceport Cornwall and Cornwall Airport Newquay. We've got an aircraft and a rocket with through Virgin Orbit. We've already got world-class mission control facilities in, in Goonhilly Earth Station. And we've also got the sat satellite applications catapult. So that, uh, the satellite applications catapult is there to help new businesses set up um, or, or for businesses who are already in existence to kind of expand um, within the space sector. The UK government has also targeted the UK with capturing 10% of the £400 billion global space economy by 2030. Currently in the UK, we manufacture a lot of the world's satellites, but we have no launch site. So that's something that we are hoping to, to achieve. There's also other spaceports that are, that are um, setting up um, across the UK. There's a few in Scotland, there's one in Wales. Um, so if you are specifically interested in spaceports, I, I would suggest doing some of your own research into, into these as well, because it is a, it's a changing playing field and there's a, a lot of developments in the area at the moment. One of the huge opportunities for us is the opportunity to inspire a generation of young people. So in the US, when the Apollo program uh, was taking off, quite literally, um, the, they found that students studied STEM subjects, so science, technology, engineering and maths, right up to the highest level, right up to doctorate, PhD level, and they didn't have any outreach program. We've got quite quite a strong outreach program uh, and we're hoping that by talking with young people and inspiring young people that they can see what the opportunities and where the opportunities are in the future and have that vision to go to go forwards with it. So what is the opportunity for you? Um, we're talking about jobs and we're not um, normally when I go into schools and talk about jobs, everybody talks about an astronaut, but the astronauts are just the very pinnacle and the real sort of limelight um, holders um, uh, from the job sector. Um, so uh, again, with the Apollo programs and with the, um, the first people walking on the moon, there are 400,000 people behind those moon landings, all doing really important jobs. So we're talking about jobs like uh, spaceport operations, space plane and rocket systems, payload integration, propulsion systems, all the people that help get those rockets um, up into up into orbit and up into the sky. Um, also talking about aerospace engineers, you know, it's, it's widely known that um, engineers are in short supply in a lot of sectors and engineers are the people that look at things, they, they work out how to solve a problem and that, then they can also go on and build it. Um, and, and they're in great demand, but it's also a really rewarding job. Another area that we're talking about is downstream application development. So once uh, those satellites have captured the data and there's heaps of data coming back, how do we use that data in a commercial way to benefit humanity? Um, and this is an area that I can see masses of opportunity in, in in the future. And if that's something that you're interested in, I would suggest doing some research on it, exploring it and, and seeing what course is available. I, I'm, I'm going on to talk about courses in a second, but yeah, downstream application development it is a real area of opportunity, I think. Um, so going to move on to routes a little bit. Um, there are some apprenticeships that have started to take off. I, I would still say they're um, more limited than uh, some of the more traditional routes of, of university, but um, there's a lot of organisations that are wanting to get involved in apprenticeships. I've highlighted one here, um, which is uh, an apprenticeship designed by Airbus. Um, and this is the first space engineering technician apprenticeship um, in the country. Um, so that, that's a great step in the right direction. Um, However, uh, last year, 62% of jobs within the space and aerospace sector required a degree um, or a degree level qualification, and you can get um, degree level apprenticeships as well now. Um, so the UCAS website, which, uh, which I've got here, is, is a great website to look at for courses, university courses. And I've just been through and, and highlighted a few of them. So you've got um, aerospace engineering, um, you've got aerospace engineering, space technology, space technology and robotics. That's a real, real growing field. Um, and then 
also on that downstream side, you've got sort of web and mobile app development, um, web design and development. Um, again, huge areas of opportunity. There's about 37,000 unique level university courses that you can study. So if you're at that stage or you're, you're a few years off that stage um, of, of going, I would really suggest having a look at that UCAS website and seeing which one sort of um, you're most attracted to and which one might, might work for you. Another way that you could do it would be to look at a website like spacecareers.uk and Space Careers advertises a lot of the jobs in the space sector in the UK at the moment. There's currently 70 jobs advertised and you could look on there to see what sort of jobs um, are on there that you're attracted to and then once you've identified that work backwards see what sort of qualifications and skills and experience that they require for that job and then work out how you can get that. OK, that's been a really quick whistle stop tour for me um, about who we are, what we do and some of the developments um, in the space sector and, and with us at Spaceport Cornwall. Um, I think now we are going to come over and have some questions. So really looking forward to those. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for that, Dave. And so we've had a few questions uh, coming for you. So one of our space engineers, Evan, uh, you touched on in your presentation, but he wants to know why Cornwall, how did it end up being there? So yeah, um, I, I think Cornwall's chosen, um, so sort of about uh, eight to ten years ago, the, the UK were looking for um, airports who may want to become spaceports, and I think Newquay put a, a sort of tentative hand up to say, yeah, you know, that, that could be appropriate for us because of our proximity to the sea and because of the long run runway, um, and because of those reasons we, we were chosen. Um, and then since then, we've been working towards um, changing the airport uh, to also incorporate a spaceport to hopefully become an airport and a spaceport in the future, which has been quite an undertaking, but um, we're very nearly there. And uh, yeah, launch next year. We're re really excited about it. So exciting. And um, so what sort of changes have you had to make? Is it, a, you said it's a big undertaking. Yeah, so there's, um, there's been a lot around the regulation, um, safe zones, um, around making sure that we've got the right facilities to, to house the plane and the rocket and to also um, to integrate the satellites into the rocket. Um, so all of those um, things are taking place at the moment. We're currently at um, sort of build phase um, and we're hoping that we'll be in a position by sort of January next year where we'll have everything in place um, to then be looking towards, towards launch later in the year. That's just so exciting that we could be launching from the UK as early as next year. And um, so we've had some questions coming into the comments. Uh, Sophie would like to know, is it likely that we'll be able to come and watch the launches? So um, we're hoping to organise um, quite a big celebration around the first launch because it will be the first launch uh, ever from the UK. Um, and um, what people will be able to see um, when, when it takes off will be the plane with the rocket taking off under its wing that will probably fly um, anywhere between sort of two and four hours to get to its launch site because the benefit of it being on a plane is the flexibility of where that, that rocket can be launched from um, to get those satellites into the specific orbits that they need to be in um, so we'll be able to see the plane taking off at, at, with, with the rocket under the wing and it coming back we won't be able to see the drop um, live but hopefully we'll have some video footage of that I would imagine. Oh, great, thank you. And we've had another uh, question come into the comments. So just a reminder, if you do have any questions, please drop them into the comments. Um, but we've been asked, would the, could there also be vertical launch capabilities from Cornwall? So, so there's, no, there's no plans yet for vertical launch, um, but um, if a provider came about and said that they would like to, to launch vertically, I'm sure it's a discussion that would be had. Um, there, would be ha there would have to be a lot of discussions to go, to go on within, within council. Uh, about looking at that but um, you know if you said to me 10 years ago that we'd have a any sort of launch from Cornwall um, I wouldn't have believed you um, so who knows what the future holds. And um, a lot of the questions that we've had from our young people are about sustainability and environmental impact which I find really really encouraging and um, what will the impact of having a spaceport in Cornwall be? Yeah, great question and great that the young people are thinking about that. Um, so we've done a full sustainability uh, impact assessment um, and a carbon impact assessment and the activities at the spaceport will increase um, sort of Cornwall's overall 
um, carbon emissions by 0.04%. Um, but we are looking to we're looking to be a carbon neutral um, spaceport, uh, and it's something we're taking really seriously. Um, so we've invested in green transport. Uh, for Cornwall, but we're also working with uh, the University of Exeter, and we've recently set um, three of their master's students um, on one of their environmental courses projects, um, and they have come up with three different ideas of, um, of how to use some of those satellites um, to, to benefit us environmentally. So one is looking at the kelp forests around Cornwall, um, because kelp is a notorious carbon sink. Um, and we're luckily surrounded by it in Cornwall, but we're not really sure how healthy that is, whether it's increasing, whether it's decreasing, um, and whether we can put things in place to help protect that. It's also a really fast growing seaweed um, that when harvested can be used for things like uh, biofuel. So that's uh, what we're exploring at the moment to, to do some research with those um, students. And then we'll hopefully be able to take that research on to the uh, appropriate people. That's great. Thank you. I just find it uh, really great that it seems to be at the forefront of young people's minds and it's uh, questions that they're asking, which I think is fantastic. Yep, same. So on the um, more commercial side, what's, what is the market demand for satellite launch in the UK, do you think? So, so I've um, said in the uh, presentation, estimated another sort of 32,000 satellites in orbit, in orbit by 2030. Um, they have a sort of variety of roles. Um, so you've probably seen a lot about um, sort of the SpaceX launches and, and the internet for all um, that Elon Musk is trying, but then there's also a lot of um, research satellites that are going up. So we're currently in discussions with um, a researcher about putting worms into space um, and, and they've put worms into space in the past. And that's to look at um, how the worms bodies cope with being in space for long periods of time. And that research will then be used to look at how our bodies may cope with long journeys to, to the likes of Mars, um, or also used for how our bodies age here on Earth. Um, so yeah, quite, um, quite huge opportunities with, with satellites really. Really, really exciting times, isn't it, in the uh, space sector, especially in the UK. Um, so one of our space engineers, Barney, has asked, what can we expect from the uh, UK space industry in the near future? I, I just think growth really, you know, we're, we're at a really exciting stage. Um, I mentioned in the presentation that that upstream and the downstream, for me, I think there's masses of opportunity in the downstream. Uh, we are already bringing back a lot of data um, and, and how do we use that data? What apps can we create? Um, how do we make that data more user-friendly? Um, I, I think there's, there's heaps of business opportunity in that area, but then also on that upstream side, you know, um, there is a growing amount of organisations looking at, at, at launches to space, both here and, and in Scotland, um, and there's, there, there's some in Wales as well. Um, so, yeah, just growth and excitement. And I think new business is, is another area of opportunity. There's a lot of support and funding out there for new business, especially around you know, looking at whether the, the new business is viable, um, that I would just suggest that if people are thinking around that area, that then, then look into some of those sources of funding, whether that be through the likes of Aerospace Cornwall or, um, or the Satellite Applications Catapult um, or the UK Space Agency. Um, yeah, I have, have some research towards that. It's uh, such a good time for a young person who's interested in space, I think, to be looking to get into the space sector. Um, so what piece of advice would you give to a young person who was really interested in space, they knew they wanted to work in the space sector? So um, first things first, I would say uh, engage. Engage with some of those organisations that you're interested in. A, a lot run competitions and events. Um, get involved with them, learn more. Um, like I said in the presentation, find, if you can, find your end goal or, or, or your current end goal and work backwards and work out your plan from now of how you get there in the future. Um, depending what stage you are um, within uh, education, there's a few um, opportunities. So internships wise, there's um, the UK Space Agency um, Space Placements in Industry or, or SPIN for short. Um, that's well worth looking at and I, and I would imagine that will be up and running within the next couple of months. 
Um, so, so have a look at that if you're interested in uh, internships. Um, the, if you're at university already, there's a, a student-led organisation called UK SEDS, um, which is, um, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's essentially students interested in space. Um, and, and that's well worth getting involved with. And if your university doesn't currently have one set up, set one up. Nothing will look better on your CV than being um, the, the, the person that set that up at your university. Um, and then again, sort of that, that Space Careers website is, is good to look at um, and just keep your interests going, really. Well, thank you so much for that, Dave. So we are unfortunately running out of time. We've had some fantastic questions from the comments. So thank you very much for those. Uh, the question I'd just like to end on, I've asked everyone this week, um, would you go to space if you could? I, I mean, I'd love to go to space uh, for a short period of time. Um, I'm not sure I would like to be one of the initial um, Mars volunteers. Um, but yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to visit the International Space Station. Great answer. Thank you so much for your time today, Dave. Um, I've really enjoyed talking to you about your spaceport in Cornwall. Thanks, Nat. Really appreciate it. And just a reminder that we've got our uh, takeover week going on all day today. So we've got two more talks today. And if there are any that you've missed, you can catch up on the National Space Centre's YouTube channel. If you'd like to get in touch, you can uh, get in touch on Twitter at UK Space Agency, or you can visit our website, nationalspaceagency.org. Thank you very much.